We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive mm -hmm. We're here in Sarasota, and it's my great pleasure to have saxophonist and composer and arranger Jerry Jerome. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be here. It's great to be down here Welcome in the to South. Sarasota. Thank you. Um, you picked I, a nice day. We did. <laughs> we did, and it's a. We're hearing some great music at the festival. Yeah. And you're a longtime resident of this area. Yeah. I guess we can say long time now. Yeah, about 23 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, originally, you're from? Uh, originally, born, uh, raised in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and then we, I, I, my whole married life, professional life, was centered around New York yeah. and Long Island. I lived on Long Island, yeah. you know, in Roslyn. You know, I read that uh, the University of Wyoming has some of your music in their archive. Is that right? Really? I think I read something you about know, that. Uh, well, if it's, mm. if it's true, we're jealous, and we want some, too. <laughs> well, sure, be happy. I, I don't recall, uh, I, I, when I broke the house down in, uh, on Long Island, I you know, gave a lot of my material to uh, the Museum of Broadcasting in New yeah. York and uh, uh, the New School. Uh -huh. But uh, I well, think Dick Hyman's wife spoke to me about Wyoming. I might have I'll, I'll just show you where I read yeah. that. Maybe mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah. And, um, you start, did you start as a clarinetist? Uh, I started as a drummer. I started as a drummer. Yeah, I was fascinated <laughs> with drums as a as a child. I, you know, in the in the uh, vaudeville th theaters, mm -hmm. see the pit drummer that was standing there watching everything that was going on stage. He, you know, we hit a ratchet and blow a whistle and put up with a dumb bang. And, you know, yes. catch all of the kicks and everything. I said, oh, wow, interesting. And I would move down to a better seat until I'd end up the fourth show. You know, looking over the rail and, at. Uh, Louis, the drummer, you know, and mm -hmm. it oh, fascinated me, and that sound was so crisp. It was just about a nine-piece pit band, you know, in Plainfield, New Jersey, where I grew up. But every theater, no matter how big or small, had uh, they had vaudeville, they had a pit band, you know, mm -hmm. and it just fascinated me. And so I'd go home and assemble all kinds of little things on the table, get two butter knives, and go through what he was doing, you know, <laughs> about nine, ten years old. My mother thought, ooh, he's a strange, strange kid. <laughs> That's and then, interesting. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, we were very poor, and uh, lessons were about $3 a lesson. My father delivered bread, and uh, when I expressed a strong interest in wanting to be a drummer, uh, he said, uh, I'll see. And he had a customer that he delivered bread to, Professor Churchillo, an Italian, one of those 300-pound guys, you know, and, and then my father worked out a deal. We gave him bread, and he gave me lessons and uh, on drums. The first day I came in there, I walked in with a pair of drumsticks that someone had given me for Christmas. And uh, I says, he started talking to me about this book, Solfeggio, wow. by Bona. I said, I, I want to be play drums. <laughs> says, I do the talking here. This is, this is the way we're and I went home and told my father what happened. Oh, you listen to Professor Churchill. <laughs> and what he was trying to tell me is that uh, the old Italian method of teaching musician was to teach him solfeggio, the ear training. No, mu no music, no musical instruments, no drums. You just look at the part and you sing it. Bo -de -do -de -do. Mm -hmm. Learn the intervals. I didn't realize, but it was an enormous help towards ear training. Mm -hmm. And after I got through with that, I went to drums. And I, I went very quickly, and I played in his band and marched up and down yeah. these uh, little towns in Jersey on, uh, on Columbus Day, and, uh -huh. you know, uh, different things. It was great. And nice uniform with the green epaulets and, you know, Italian style. And all. <laughs> Loved it. And at home, I'd practice, you know. My mother said, I wish you could find something nice like a violin. As drums, bang, bang, bang. Oh. I was in, then in the garage, you know. <laughs> so I said, all right, violin didn't, didn't interest me at all, Mark. That sounded very, you know, not, mm -hmm. not my style. And then left-handed, you know. <laughs> so one day I saw an ad in my uncle's uh, grocery store, and it showed a guy with two beautiful chicks on his arms looking up at him adoringly. And the caption said, if you want to be the life of the party, 
play a C melody con saxophone. <laughs> I said, that's what I want to do. Be a saxophone player. Um, it, it's interesting that they even said C melody. Oh yeah, that was that was that was it. You know, I don't think the tenor and alto were well, they weren't published. They were trying to push a new thing because the idea of a C melody saxophone, no transposition. Right. You read it all. And it showed a guy, you know, guys playing over the piano, you know. I said, that's oh, sound, yeah. you know? Yeah, just reading the piano cover. Uh -huh. So I said, uh, that's sound. Uh, so I got this beautiful nickel plated con C melody sax with little green buttons and little red things here like that. <laughs> and uh, came with a little book that said th the black means push it down, the white means leave it open. I said, hey, there's only t 10 or 12 of those. That's look for me. So I push it down and I, st I learn how to play. And I, you know, uh, I actually didn't get a teacher yet at that time because I felt that uh, mm -hmm. that was enough. Then I got a teacher and started br brushing up on it. And coming from a small town like Plainfield, New Jersey, I. Uh, Literally, was one of the few saxophone players in town. And when the good one left to get a job in New York, they called me, and I was was not ready at all. You know, I, I had no idea about these things. I was a terrible reader; couldn't couldn't read beans. But I had an ear that was ear. that was unbelievable. And I can recall, uh, you know, guys would the piano player would go to the to the to, uh, Woolworths on Saturday and pick up the latest tune that was published it would be like five foot two eyes of blue you know <laughs> this is in the 20s about 1925 26 you know and uh, it was incredible you know I just get on a job and I wouldn't you know I'd listen to him and I'd play you know around him you know just jazzing which was the kind of the style and everybody was at that that letter everybody was peppy you know mm -hmm. jazzy and uh, I played uh, long enough to uh, earn some money and you know, help my father out. Uh huh. Yeah. So I, in a sense, I paid back the saxophone right. in a short period of time. That's a, that's a great story. Um, if it hadn't been for music, <clears throat> am I right in saying you might have uh, been Dr. Jerome? Yeah. I uh, I finished um, pre medicine and mm -hmm. went to the University of Alabama Medical School and uh, finished two years there and went up to Ann Arbor, Michigan to take a, a summer course that would have gotten me into, into Ann Arbor, the third year program. And uh, there was a delay because I was from out of state. And uh, so I went back to New York to earn some money. I needed to go back to school. And in the interim, I was very interested in, in, the, in the, the new aspect of music for me, which was uh, being highly professional. You know, I, I started with Harry Reeser and his Clico Club Eskimos. Clico Club Eskimos. Yeah. He was a very famous uh, 20s orchestra in, mm -hmm. in early radio. And at that time, he was, uh, had assembled a band that was trying to emulate the Goodman style, but with his own character, namely a banjo and a Hammond organ. You know, everybody tried to work out something in a swing. Mm -hmm in a swing area. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was great. Uh, I enjoyed playing with him. Didn't make much money, but I sure saw the United States of America. We traveled the Midwest during the Depression in 1935, 36. And uh, things were very tough, but uh, he managed to, to work all over the place because, as he explained, the poor people would save up whatever pennies they had, and Saturday night they'd go yeah. and fling it out, have a ball, forget about the troubles. It Hear seems no matter how the hard times are, people will still, yeah. they still need entertainment. Man, to do, do something like that just to, to assuage their yeah. problems, you know. Yeah. But uh, I was with Harry until we got to New York, and we were playing the uh, Raymore Ballroom, and George Simon came up with uh, Glenn Miller and introduced me to Glenn. I didn't know who Glenn was, never heard of him. You know, he was a side man then. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he was playing with Ray Noble and doing theater dates or, you know, uh, radio commercials, mm -hmm. whatever, recordings, you know, thing. And, uh, oh, George Simon had given me an A, an A minus rating oh. in the, the band myself. He said that George Saravo and Jerry Jerome were two of the, you know, 
outstanding <laughs> players in the band. Hey. You mean in print he had done this? Yeah, he, wrote, oh, he was the editor of, Metrono yes. of uh, Metrono Magazine. And he'd given the band a, b a big write-up, a wonderful write-up. Uh -huh. And he told Glenn that there are several players in that band that he might be interested in this new band that he was forming. So Glenn came over and, uh, and uh, said he liked my playing, and would I like to join the band? He'd like to have me. I said, Glenn, what does it pay? Because I was still interested in going back to medical school. He says, $45 a week. I said, that's what I'm getting with Harry Reeser. I, I couldn't see any advancement that way. He said, yeah, we, we're going to grow. We're going to be great. We're going to be great. And I'm recording next week. I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, recording a Decca. Oh, that sounds pretty good to me. Decca, recording. So I made my decision. I left Harry, went with Glenn. This is a cute story, Mark. I went, to, went into the studio to record the, f the first thing with Glenn, and I start to, f to recognize some of the musicians. Manny Klein, Charlie Spivak, Will Bradley. This is the kind of player I says, oh my God, what am I doing here? And Glenn just, you know, taking charge. I said, now Jerry, uh, uh, I got rhythm, won't you take 32 bars? Oh, wow, I'm playing jazz. Hey. This is it. It's worth the 45 bucks. All right. And I played my first record with Glenn when I think it was I Got Rhythm, I think it was uh -huh. Hal McIntyre. Uh -huh. We were the only two people that, that had been, you know, with a new group that Glenn had gotten up. And I couldn't figure out what I'm doing with this band until we got up to the Ray Mall Ballroom to rehearse for opening that, that uh, job. There wasn't any of these guys, mm -hmm. just Hal, myself, and all new, all new players. I said to Glenn, what happened to Charlie Spivak and Manny Klein? Oh, he says, they're buddies of mine, you know, and I wanted to make a real good record <laughs> for my first big yeah. band record. So he said they came in, you know. It got the ringers. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> and then we went to work. Uh -huh. And it was work. He was a taskmaster. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, I didn't mind, you know, this is all new for me. You know. He was a taskmaster, but he wanted perfection, you know, and, and he was also struggling for an identity. You know, in those days, band leaders had identity to, to a hook. You a know, sound, to, yeah. Sound, something, you know, right. even a guy like Kay Kaiser, would, his sound was his personality. Just introducing the band, and here comes Sassy Sully Mason to sing a tune, you know. But that was his, uh -huh. that was how you could identify him. Or Shep Fields blowing water through a straw, you know, a bubbling rhythm, you know. Whatever, whatever pleases you, you know. And Glenn ha had trouble. He was not a trombone player like Tommy Dorsey. In fact, he was rather pedestrian, I thought. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't think his jazz amounted to very much. And proof is, he never, he never really uh, fronted with his trombone, you know, playing. He, yeah. He would, you know, lead the band up front and go back and play with a section in my band, the band I was with. And he was, so he had to use his arranging acumen. Because he wasn't that, um, he wasn't a really outgoing type person. No. Nality, right? Mm -mm. So he couldn't uh, push that part of it. No. Oh, not at all. Yeah. He was, um, he used to have his jaws twitch all the time when he asked a question. He, he had to compose himself to... Mm. Kind of, you know, of course, you know, godly change later. Yeah. Money in your pocket will change your personality at times, I'm told. <laughs> I don't know about that either. <laughs> but uh, Glenn was a, was a great experience, a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I learned what, what playing notes properly is right and how to, yeah. how to uh, really... Uh, play by the marks, Glenn would say, crescendo, diminuendo, and he says, keep it under, keep it, go above. But uh, one thing that comes to my mind is so cute. When I <clears throat> played my solo of I Got Rhythm with Glenn, I listened to it, you know, and, you know, it's a chorus, you know, you do a thousand of those on a recording, you never come over, the, never do the same thing. Yeah. You're imp improvising, you know. You. So we w went out on our first one-nighter after, after we 
did our recording somewhere along the line. And uh, I got up and played and played a totally different chorus as I heard it, you know. The, right. Which is, you know, when a soloist uh, preference, I would think. Glenn came over to me and said, he said, Jerry, he says, um, when you stand up and play a solo, I wish you'd play the one that's on the record. I says, why? He says, well, he says, I consider that part of the arrangement. Oh. If people expect it. They buy the record and, and they expect to hear that. Oh. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Stock went down. I sometimes wonder some of those classic trumpet solos and some of the Miller arrangements, uh, were they improvised first and then someone actually wrote them out? The, the, uh, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. like in String of Pearls. Oh, and, sure. And it's almost like what you're saying. Th yeah. that, that solo, even though it might have been improvised first, yeah. became a part of the arrangement. Without then. question. So, uh, you, know, you know, now, the, now that, like, uh, there have been a lot of Miller bands that have come along the, the line, and I noticed that most of them that stand up play the solos that are on the record. Yeah. And I think that's, again, for identity, mm -hmm. to make it sound more like the Miller band. Right. So he had a point, but the, the part B of that statement is that when I joined Benny Goodman, and I got up, stood up and played undecided on a one-nighter, and I played what I'd played on the, on the record, and Benny came over to me and he said, did you like what you played on the record? <laughs> oh, I oh. said, thank you, Benny. Yeah. Yeah, see, that's the difference. Yeah. Benny didn't, Benny, no. Glenn Miller was, was not a jazz band, per se. It was more of a, a dance. Yeah. Yeah. And the best. Yeah. Really, he was great. His yeah. tempos were great. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he strove for, for an audience yeah. reaction to, what do you like? You know, what can I play for you? Yeah. Well, you went from one uh, maybe tough leader to, uh, to another with Benny Goodman. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I have to, you know, uh, that's a relative word, Mark tough because uh, they weren't tough as far as I'm concerned. You know, I, could, I understood Glenn. Glenn. I was a confidant of Glenn's. Glenn was, and I were close. Uh, I might tell you this, it's an it's interesting bit of uh, history from my point of view. And that is, uh, I stayed with Glenn until he broke the band up. You know, I think it was New Year's Eve. We had our last gig. <clears throat> and then, as I recall, the reason he broke it up was because Mo Pirtle had just joined him on drums, and Glenn was happy. This was a fine drummer, and he, you know, he was really cementing a problem because he kept f firing drummers, you know, either because they, their behavior, or because they just weren't up to what he had had expected out of the band. Mm -hmm. Ben had a loggy feeling at times, and when I had good drummer, it had a good feeling. If you listen to some of the records that we made there, they don't sound too much like the Miller Band, but they sure play good. They, you know, they're, they're well recorded, and they're good, good players in there. But um, uh, Glenn broke the, the band up on uh, New Year's Eve, or the day after that, and uh, he said, I'll call you when I reorganize. He had to get some more money and get his, get his second band started. He called me three months later in March, and... Uh, uh, I met him at, at the Rialto Bar in New York, and I forget that on 40, 49th Street, which is sort of Musicians Alley at that time, mm -hmm. all the hotels where the musicians stayed, and the bars and all that, you know, sort of our own little place. Uh -huh. And uh, Glenn said, I'm reorganizing, and I'd like to have you come back. But he says, I want you to be a third partner with me and Shummy McGregor, the piano player. He says, we'll draw the same salary, put up a car, split gasoline, put third bona fide partner. And I had just joined Red Norville, mm -hmm. and I loved that band. It was just a small band, I think it was nine men, but it was had a lot of tenor saxophone playing, you know, and playing with Glenn was very restrictive in that area. It was, you know, reading a lot of music, and an occasional 32 bars, but you never let a guy blow. Yeah. You know, in other words, if it's cooking, Forget about it. It was never, never a, a situation like that. There were, you know, things to play, but, and I was a solo tenor man. In fact, I did a novelty with him at doing a jive. I talked with Glenn. We did a thing like Tex uh -huh. and Glenn, you know, which, uh, you know, neither one of us were, were very, 
much into this area. I certainly never sang, I never, that kind of a thing. But uh, I turned him down. Mm -hmm. And he was very crestfallen. He asked if I would come and rehearse the saxes for him at uh, the studio that he was, at my, which I did. And in that sax section was a kid from, from came out from I think Detroit at the time was Tex Beneke. Uh -huh. He took my place in the sense, yeah. you know, and he was the right guy for that mm -hmm. for that band without question. He did a better, did better by getting Tex. Because he became a singer also. Oh, everything. Yeah, he was right. great. Just yeah. as what Glenn wanted. Because he was trying to do that. See how, with my talking right. these things. You know, I wasn't singing, but I was talking these little oh. novelty things. Yeah. Alla Ray McKinley, that kind of. That's what Glenn had in his mind. Yeah. It's a personality, Western, country. You know, get that style into the band. So, uh, I, I was very happy with Red, and I was certainly happy. First of all, I was making eighty-five bucks a week. And playing in New York and not traveling was just uh -huh. wonderful. Yeah. Playing at the Commodore Hotel, uh -huh. come in every night and play with this wonderful band, beautiful room, and uh, you know, going by my way. Mm -hmm. And I was still in it, saving up to go back to med school at this point. Sure was. You know, it was, this is not really show business yet for me. Right. And then uh, after that, I. I uh, Got a job at WNEW New York as a staff musician, and that was for me was a step up too, because uh, it paid much more and less playing, mm -hmm. and you're you're safely ensconced in a pit band, you know, yeah. or, or that kind of a band, a ten piece group. But mm -hmm. I played all the jazz, and we had some unbelievable people working at the station. Dinah Shore was a staff singer. Wow. You know, struggling along with all of us, and uh, Richard Brooks was a wrote copy, and he became a big producer of films in California. Writer, a producer. This was for radio broadcasts. Only. Uh, oh yeah, this was 1937. Yeah, yeah radio was uh, extremely important. Oh, it was big. It was so important, Monk, that when you think of a town like New York, <clears throat> with WMCA, WNEW, small stations local that covered only a bit of Connecticut, a bit of Jersey and, and New York basically, had ten piece orchestras in the for staff, you know. Oh. And uh, there were three hundred men that employed at NBC, ABC and CBS. Every theater had a pit band. Music was flourishing. Yeah. It was it, it was entertainment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, oh I I love that job. You know, I got fat and furious, you know, it was <laughs> But again, it was, you know, uh, while I played some jazz, it was, it was all marked according to time because we had a, you know, program to do a half hour show, a 15 minute show, or accompany somebody, you know, do that kind of thing. It was nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I loved that show, particularly because at night, I used to sit in with John Kirby's Six Pieces on 52nd Street, which was zooming, you know, bloom. And uh, I played not tenor, but bass clarinet with, uh, with um, John Kirby, because uh -huh. they had a very set group, and I learned their, their, learned their arrangements. I see. And uh, I enjoyed that very much, and go back to NAW, and one day uh, there was a disc jockey named Martin Block, a very famous Block that had a show called the Make Believe Ballroom. It's still around, you know, still there, at, uh, not at WNEW anymore, though, but on syndicated shows that carried the that carries a make believe ball on, on radio. And uh, every Friday he had a show called Jive at Five. Mm, I've heard of that. And he got the outstanding players that come in the city with their bands like Tommy Dorsey or Goodman or Shaw and they'd be thrilled to come out and do this show for nothing because he plugged their records. And he was the most important disc jockey not only in New York but probably over the country. Martin Block's Make Believe Ballroom. <clears throat> and uh, uh, on this given Friday afternoon, Jive at Five, he had Benny Goodman, Count Basie, Rhythm Section, you know, Walter Page and Joe Jones and, and Freddie Green, and uh, Lester Young, and uh, I th think Buck Clayton was supposed to show up on this show. So there, about 10 minutes before, 
Lester Young hadn't showed up. Uh -huh. And he was out somewhere up there, you know, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't find Madison Avenue and 52nd Street. So uh, Martin said, well, we got a pretty good, good tenor man here, Jerry Jerome. Betty said, uh, yeah, yeah, but get your horn, you know, to sit in. Uh, reason being that I didn't know, but in that retrospect, he, he and Bud Freeman were not getting along, and he, I guess he wanted to hear another tenor man. So I got on my horn, couldn't wait to play, because uh, years before when I was with Reeser, I had sat in with Basie in Kansas City in 1937 when he had the, had the little seven-piece, six, yeah. seven-piece band. Oh, and what a, that's a whole other episode of my life, Mark, you know. Uh, we'll come back to that, all right? We have to, yeah, that's Kansas City is something else. That's, well, yeah. it turned my whole life around. Because uh -huh. by this time, I was playing like Lester. Yeah. That's the point. And I sat in and played with Benny, and Benny apparently liked what he heard. And Basie made a fuss over me, you know, yeah, Jerry, and blah, 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 you know. And uh, I said, what are you doing tonight? You want to come down and play with my band? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Waldorf Astoria, Empire yeah. Room. And this is the fall of 30, 38. 30, 38. So I put on my tux and came down there. And when I think about it, Mark, you know, there was no rehearsal. I just sat in on the second tenor chair and started reading. Because, you know, I was so crazy about that band, I just almost could feel where the, mm -hmm. where the parts lay. Yeah. And it was very much, uh, I'd say, 90% of the arrangements were Fletcher Henderson. So if you knew one Fletcher arrangement, uh -huh. you, you knew about where uh -huh. you were. You know, yeah. it was never uh, like an Eddie Sawyer thing. It was totally unpredictable. Mm -hmm. But you knew, you know, everything laid very, very smooth. <clears throat> So then he says, why don't you see me tomorrow morning? And I came up to his office, and he offered me this fabulous job. And I said, well, this is the band. Harry Reeser, uh, I mean, Harry James on trumpet, you know, and Ziggy and Chris. And the whole, you know, the, the smaller band, yeah. just the five brass, four saxes, mm -hmm. and four rhythm. Fabulous. So I, he gave me a wonderful deal. And the uh, only thing I played bass clarinet with him. And I said I didn't have a bass clarinet. Had you played it before? He's, yeah. He says, no, I hadn't played it you before. You hadn't played it before. No. He said, you play mine. <laughs> I had to run out and get a lesson from Joe Allard real fast. Hey, how do you put this thing together? <laughs> and when I joined Benny, we recorded Bach Goes a Ton. I didn't, you know, <laughs> got to do it. You know, you just, there's no time to start hedging, you know. You just, yeah. Bum, 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 Came right up to like a That's a great story. Sweet. <laughs> um, was in 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 that Goodman group, was mm -hmm. that the one that had Teddy Wilson? Yeah. Yeah. Teddy and Teddy Lionel. Lionel. <clears throat> and uh, later Charlie Christian mm -hmm. when he joined uh, in the sextet. It was a fabulous Quite band. An experience. It was just wonderful and it was well that turned my life around. Mm -hmm. I said if if I can make it here with the, with the limited amount of tools that I had developed, I never had gone to a music school or, or had planned to get into this scene like that. And I was comfortable. I, I could handle whatever Benny put up, you know. Yeah. Well, I guess you owe a, somewhat of a debt to that Italian professor in the early days. <laughs> professor Churichillo and his pasta. He had pasta going all day long. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, it's great. I, I really, uh, he knew what he was doing. Uh -huh. uh, it's hard to recommend that to kids today. How would you yeah. tell a kid not to play your instrument, just go, do me fa so, you know? Yeah. Well, take us, uh, take us to Kansas City for a moment, <clears throat> if you would. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> playing with Harry was very tough because, as I say, we did mostly one-nighters throughout the Midwest. And, uh, not only was it during Depression time, but it was one of the worst droughts in American history. There are pictures of these little, little dry tornadoes that had nothing <laughs> to even yeah. pick up, you know. The, and uh, I, took, I had to have a picture in my scrapbook of the North Platte River. I'm standing on it uh -huh. and showing how high it's supposed to be. Incredible. Uh, 
So it was, it was not a lot of fun. It was tough, but I was, but again, that was at the very beginning of my career. So I just accepted this the way music is, and when I get make enough money, I'll get out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. But when we got to Kansas City, we played Fairyland Park Casino, and we were there for quite a number of weeks because the band they were he was popular. And I did what most of the musicians do: you prowl, look first of all, you look for a place to find some good barbecue ribs, <laughs> and a place to get a drink after hours. Mm -hmm. Kansas City under Pendergast was a swing and a, I couldn't believe this city. Nothing closed. Everything stayed open. And I found my way to, uh, I, with my horn in my hand, because I always had that with, my, with me, had my tenor with me. And I found myself in, in, the, in the colored part of town, you know, on 17th Street, and went into a place called the Lone Star. And I was absolutely mesmerized by it by a, a uh, pianist, Mary Lou Williams, oh. who was playing piano, female, with Bus Moten, who was related to Benny Moten. Well, the whole idea of a woman playing jazz piano, and not only a woman, but the way she played jazz, I, said, I was absolutely intrigued. So when she came off the stand, I went over and said, I'd like to buy a drink, which I did. I said, is there any policy about sitting in? Oh, we love to have, we love people to come and sit in. So I sat in with, with this little five-piece group there. And I, I was in heaven. I said, my, I'd never... They had a different beat, mm -hmm. Monk. It was, a, it was a very strong 4-4 four, four beat. And piano players, instead of playing up here, concentrated their efforts and made it a rhythm instrument, not a solo uh -huh. instrument. It's the way I would describe it. They just fed you. And uh, they used to call them Bostons. You know, the rhythm is a Boston, they call it. A Boston? Boston. Huh. I don't know why that name comes to my mind. Is I that, haven't heard that before. It's a Boston, like a solo. This, uh, the, the way you play behind a solo. The comping style. I think that might oh. be what it might be. But uh -huh. I, I long forget. But uh, she finished around 3 o'clock in the morning. Her, her gig finished. She said, you do anything now? I said, no. She says, come with me. I, she took me to the Reno Club. Uh -huh. now, I didn't know it was Kansas City. I didn't know where. Reno Club. I walked in there. And I, I said, if there's any way of describing what uh, a ventriloquist dummy that's on a rod can do when his head goes like that, you know, yeah. you spin it around. Yeah. I heard Lester Young and, and this basic group, just, you know, a uh, small group. I think there were just the two, two woodwinds, two saxes, baritone and tenor. And uh, trombone and, and trumpet and four rhythm. No music on the stand, just playing charts. They were head, under head, <clears throat> head arrangements. Head, head arrangements. And I just went crazy listening to that band. And I went back every night until I got to know Lester and bass. And I established contact with Basie because when I heard he's from Res Bank, New Jersey, I said, I'm from Plainfield, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, bum, bum, bum. And that he had an ashtray, you know, that had little roaches on them, you know, that are, you yeah. know, well-spent marijuanas, you know, <laughs> just that little bit. They'd save them and grind them up and yeah. <laughs> do them again, you know. Right. But drinking was open and it was, and they started like early, a little bit earlier, but they went all night. <clears throat> and uh, oh. Lips Page was the master of ceremonies. And he would introduce the stars that would come in, not just players, but Dancers, singers, whatever, come in, do your turn, you know, do mm -hmm. the thing. And they had a balcony with all the rich white people would sit with these beautiful hats, the ladies, and they'd sit, sip perno and just get out of their heads, you know, listening to this good music. Hmm. It's just a sort of a orgiastic kind of a thing, you yeah. know, the, and the music turned everybody on, you know. Was the atmosphere, was it um, semi-segregated? It was totally segregated. It was totally segregated. Yeah. How did you fit into that? Well, no, you, uh, you're talking about the place? Yeah. No, no, well, the place was not. The okay. place was not segregated okay. at all. But the feeling in Kansas City was blacks were blacks and whites were whites. That's right. the way it was. But you were accepted because you were a player. Yeah. yeah. And no one bothered me. Right. Uh, I went, when I went to University of Alabama and I went to hear Earl Hines, they kicked me out. They says, you, you ain't no business being here, get out. 
cups. This was what year? Mm. 33, 34. Mm. Interesting. And this wasn't that much different in Kansas City, I didn't think, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I never saw any blacks in any, in any uh, good jobs or things like that. I think right. they were subjugated, you know, at that right. point. Mm -hmm. But uh, I went anyway, you know, and if they if gave me a bad time, uh, I'd get out. I would, I'd never fight cops, you know, and I don't do that, right. but I'd like to go where I would like to go. And uh, so I sat in with Basie a few times, you know, and it's just fabulous. I was just absorbing mm -hmm. the, the, what I was hearing out of Lester Young. He was just incredible and a very, very quiet man, too, mm -hmm. to himself. But I, I, you know, of course, took up with the Basie Band when I came back to, when I came to New York, when I heard the big band. But that turned my, turned my thing around, you know. I said, this is the way to play a horn. Because, you know, coming out of the 20s, you know, you heard Paul Whiteman, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Bert Lown, you know, uh, and, uh, and even Casaloma was a good jazz, good band, but it's not a jazz band. A very sweet. The players are not. Yeah. They call them sweet bands. Yeah. 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 More yeah. dance bands that were right. trying to play jazz mm -hmm. rather than, than jazz. Of course, it was Colin Hawken records and Louis Armstrong records and those kind of things. But to hear someone live that could do this thing, and to this day, I, I sit and listen to Lester Young and. My, in a car and I'm driving and I grin from ear to ear because yeah. I can just see him, you know. Uh -huh. And he didn't care whether he made mistakes or not. He'd play these unbelievable, uh, strange idioms, but they came out. They, somehow we made it work. <laughs> huh? came out. Yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. You got into uh, producing? Well, yeah. I went with Artie, Artie Shaw. Yeah. Jeff, then he broke the band up in Catalina Island. In 1940, to have his uh, back operated on, he says, "I don't know when I'm coming back, but maybe in the fall or something like that." You know, mm -hmm. this was summertime, and uh, he said, uh, "I'll call you." But meanwhile, we we all three, six of us joined Artie Shaw a day after we left. Catalina was waiting for us. He needed a. He was organizing his new band. Mm -hmm. He had been. He had a, a band that he had uh, was out on record with the strings, the 12 strings. But they were studio musicians. They were all, you know, uh, studio mu type guys. And he wanted to have a band to go with, to travel with. And so we, you know, we went with them. Vernon Brown, myself, Nick Fatul, Les Robinson. And uh, it was a fine band, very good musical band, and uh, good for dancing, you know. Uh, and. Uh, but again, I'm back. When am I play a tenor solo? You know, it was not a not a jazz band. It was just not, not a swing band. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Not a swing band. It was uh, playing swing with strings. But to me, that was sort of a heavy feel for an mm -hmm. improviser. You know, you want to play against a Kansas City four-four. You want to get some Boston. Yeah, <laughs> get some Boston in there. So actually. Um, uh, I stayed with Artie until he came to New York. I recorded with him, did a lot of his, some of his fine things like Stardust, I'm on that, and Concerto for Clarinet. We made the picture, second chorus. Second with, chorus. It was a lot of fun. How can it not be fun looking at uh, Paulette Goddard? <laughs> Short skirts, <laughs> my goodness. She was great. How long did those things take, how long did that film take? Mm -hmm. Was it a matter of a couple of weeks in the filming that movie? Yeah, for us, because we, we were only, we were in segments, you yeah. know, we weren't throughout the whole thing, but it was, but it was good. We had one great episode in, in, in that movie, if you see it. Uh, you know the story uh, of Fred Astaire and Bur Burgess Meredith are trying to, to get with, with Artie's band. They're trumpet players. And uh, so they both, you know, Paulette arranges an audition. She's an agent for, for uh, some outfit. And uh, for Artie, she's trying to sell him these two guys. So they, <clears throat> Fred Astaire, uh, uh, Burgess Meredith auditions first. So while he wasn't looking, Burgess took his music, you know, that, that Artie's music, and changed the notes and everything like that. 
So Burgess gets up and he plays and he's reading along and all of a sudden he reads in these strange notes and he's playing bad notes. And Shaw looks at him and says, what the heck's this guy doing? Out, get off, get off, get off. Burgess, he says, he knows that son of a gun, that sucker did it, you know. <laughs> so Astaire, you know, very cocky gets up there to play his parts. So you know how Astaire does these things. And he starts playing. The camera uh, uh, pans to a shot behind the bandstand, and they're up on a high. Uh -huh. His brass is up on about three feet up. And of course, when they do the shot, the, what happens then is that a, a Burgess waits at some point and grabs the chair and pulls it. <laughs> then, of course, the camera yeah. stops, and they go to another shot. Uh, not another shot, but in reality, they had a gym mat. Oh. And, oh, about that much of a fall. So the, the producer, Boris Moore, said, look, we'll have a stuntman do the, do the, the pratfall. Meredith, who was drinking at the time, said, ah, I'll do it. <laughs> and he did. He took us. That was him. Oh. He went, went over, but he only went over about this far. Right. But that's not very comfortable either, right. you know. Right. But in the, in the, in the shot, it looks like, like he had dumped him. So both of them didn't get the job. <laughs> that was a fun part. <laughs> yeah. Thing. It's interesting how big a part the, the music was of the whole industry, the entertainment industry at that time. Oh, yeah. And until uh, television came around, you know. <clears throat> and that, uh, I, was, I was in that in the very, mm -hmm. very beginning, you know. Uh, I, uh, I, I think I said that I <clears throat> left Shaw and went through a year of penance in New York City because you can't take pr uh, good work to, until you get your, your 802 card. That's a union yes. stipend. And uh, it's tough, but you can, you can play club dates. You can play these casual engagements with like Meyer Davis or, mm -hmm. or Lester Lannon or you know, whatever, whatever bands are around. And uh, I have a cute story about that. So I was just doing these, doing these um, single dates. And what would happen is that uh, someone would recommend you to a leader, and the leader didn't know you, He'd ask a lot of questions. What do you look like? I mean, how does he look on a job? Does he play? Does he know? You know, they for for a fourteen dollar job. You know, they go through all this bit. You know, so <clears throat> I was recommended to a guy named Eli Danzig, who was a band leader at the St. George Hotel in Brooklyn, and one of these old time guys played terrible fiddle, but he fronted the band with a fiddle. You know, mm -hmm. that made him look good. You know. So, typically, there'd be some good players in the band, and when a, a new guy comes off the road, like Goodman and from Goodman's band or Shaw's band or mm -hmm. whoever, you know, <clears throat> they'd recommend me, and I got this job. So they'd say to the band leader, Eli, let him play, let him play, meaning let him get up and blow a little bit. <clears throat> and he'd be reluctant, because that was not dance music, you know, for the public out there. So this one time, he walked over to me and he said, uh, had a bit of an accent. He said, uh, you know Stardust? I says, yeah, Stardust. Play Stardust. So I get up and I close my eyes and I go, get into sensuous swinging, all improvised, you know. And when I finish, the guy says, yeah. Danzig walks over to me and says, what you play? I says, I played Stardust. You play Stardust? Yeah. <laughs> he took his fiddle and stood in front of me, went through the whole chorus, Straight melody with his <laughs> fiddle. He says, that's Stardust. <laughs> and I learned, if you're going to be in a club date yeah. business, play the melody. You play the melody. <laughs> yeah. Can't go wrong. I've seen bumpers. Don't listen to the guys. <laughs> There's a company in Chicago that puts out bumper stickers that says, play the melody. Really? You know, yeah, because they're, they, I don't know, they're into the old uh, things. Dave Cap had a big sign uh, with an Indian. Uh, like this, you know, pray in the heaven, and yeah. science said, play the melody, <laughs> and in the deck of studios, honest. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's that was the money part of mm -hmm. playing it. So I, uh, I hung in with with this for a long time. Yeah. And uh, I went into, you know, conducting at NBC and and uh, studying arranging, composing, and formed my own company to write jingles. And, for 25 years, and I didn't do much playing. Mm -hmm. 
horn at the time, except when they, we'd have a session, the guys would come in and do that. And then, uh, uh, I came down here to Sarasota, mm -hmm. retire, and picked up the horn again. I've been playing concerts and right. going back to blowing the horn again. You'd get a, a contract to do a com uh, like a jingle for some company. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I wrote a jingle for Miller High Life Beer mm -hmm. back in, uh, I guess, in the 60s. And uh, they, they wanted a, a different kind of a male singer. So I got Joe Williams. Mm -hmm. And they loved it. And Joe did a fantastic job. It swings. I got a, like a small swing band behind him, a la Basie. Brought up a little bit in, in, in the style, maybe a little more modern. Mm -hmm. But they loved him. And uh, I used Al Hurt as a soloist on one of those things. I used um, one of my favorite singers was um, Whitney Houston's mother. Oh. Yeah? Yeah. She, she did an awful lot of jingles with me. Did Salem. Did um, um, Winston, did um, Open Pit Barbecue Sauce, <laughs> Maxwell House Coffee. Yeah. Yes. Sissy, Sissy Houston. She was some great singer. You know, had honesty. You know, she wasn't copying anything. She just sounded like a, you know, good robust How'd singer. How'd that jingle with Joe go? <clears throat> I'm not much of it. Enjoy life with the bright, clear taste of beer. Miller High Life, the champagne of bottle beer. Oh, yeah. Da da dee, da 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 da. He went down. A little, he could do that, you know. Yeah. Da 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 da. Miller High Life, the champagne of bottle beer. Sparkling. Da da da. Da da da. We've like got to find a copy of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got. I've got, got these. Right. Yeah, I've got them all. But uh, I really. I told you about it. He got a kick out of that. Yeah. But he. Uh, was a very fine gentleman to work with, mm -hmm. worked very hard. And uh, if he hadn't gone into being such a big singer, he probably would have done very well in the jingle field. He could uh -huh. have, because yeah. he had a lot of, uh, a lot of resonance, mm -hmm. good sound. And then, um, you know, I did uh, jingles for television. You know, a lot of them were on television. I got into the Spanish field, did, uh, did Tito Puente, you know, and, Used them an awful lot, but Joe was uh, was uh, an outstanding player. You know, now he's going to get the, uh, um, the Satchmo, Satchmo tonight. Yeah, yeah. Or is tonight? I think Saturday might be night. might be Saturday, Saturday, Saturday night. night. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, you've had a, a really fascinating career in those. I those do it all over again. Your, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Those moments in your life where you, you know, were next to Lester Young and. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things are really pr priceless. You don't realize at the time that, that you're that you're sitting next to history. You know, you don't know that. You just you just know that this is something else. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't think about that. I, you know, I wish I'd taken more pictures or or written more documentation. But you know, an amazing thing, Mark. I get letters from people all over the country, all over the world, that send me material about where I was and when I was. You know, it's incredible that, you know, uh, some, from, some Peter, Peter Broadbent from England is doing a thing on Charlie Christian, the guitar player. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> Charlie was with the band. I know a lot of things about Charlie. And in return, the guy sent me a, literally a diary of the time that I was with Benny when Charlie was with the band. Oh, and it's incredible, you know, that I'm looking at, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I'm glad those kind of people are around that oh, take such an interest in it. There are many. Yeah. Believe me, I bump into them all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to Germany to do 20 concerts in the fall, and the guy told me, bring plenty of CDs and, and, um, and a fountain pen. He said, mm -hmm. these people will tell you things about you, or they'll want to know things about right. things. They're very avid, ardent fans. And God bless them. I think that's what's keeping jazz alive. Yeah. I People think like America uh, <clears throat> can be pleased, to say the least, with the fact that we've spread this music to other parts of the world. Yeah. And sometimes it's more popular in other parts than it is here. Yeah. Um, what's your, uh, just to wrap up, uh, what do you listen to these days? <clears throat> 
Well, I'm, uh, in the past, since I retired, I've you know I've had the time. I, I like classical music. I enjoy that. I go to all of the concerts here. I enjoy that very much. I, I'd rather listen to classical music in a car, for example, mm -hmm. than listen to jazz in a car, because it's it's uh, relaxing, and you know I get too involved with jazz sometimes, and I'm not, I, I don't concentrate as well. <laughs> yeah. But I like. Um, I'm just. I'm not into into modern jazz fusion or mm -hmm. uh, even bebop. Truthfully, I mean I, I appreciate it, but I'm a, I'm a traditionalist. I like that middle of the road jazz, uh, mainstream if you want to call it. Right. But that's uh, and the singers that go along with that. Yeah. That kind of, of of stuff. I like it. You recommended some some pretty good people along the way too, didn't you? Uh, Warren Vache and yeah. kind of. Helped them land yeah. some spots. Derek Smith. Derek Smith. In the beginning, you know. Derek worked me a lot, and Benny would call me from time to time and say, Who's good? <laughs> I'd always, I'd, Benny and I maintained a relationship for a long time. We'd mm -hmm. have lunch together at his club or some fish house in, yeah. on the east side of New York. He just loved to go there. Manhattan House, I think. Oh, he stayed at the Manhattan House. I heard Benny Goodman would never pick up the tab for lunch. Is that true? <laughs> he did with me, but uh, but the one time I said to Benny, uh, "Hey, I'm going to have to take you out next time." He says, "You keep threatening." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm yeah. getting got back at him. Yeah. Oh, we were playing the Fox Theater in Detroit, <clears throat> and uh, he said, "Hey, it's a great restaurant down the street." And well, it was only about half a block down, Russian Bear, outside of the backstage of the Fox Theater in mm -hmm. Detroit. So he, he says, "Come on." Come on. Sneeze. He called Artie, Artie, Artie or Laney Sneeze, big nose. And uh, he says, Jaime Shorts and myself, he says, come on, we'll go, go eat. So we went there. Hey, Benny's popping great. Boy, they turned him on. Okay, wonderful service. Had a fiddle player coming, staring at us. And just before the dessert, Benny says, oh my God, I didn't change a read. Uh, I'll, I'll get you later. <laughs> Typical. That's the way Benny did it. He's gone. And if he was wanting a cigarette, instead of saying, uh, anybody got a cigarette, he'd go like this. <laughs> and sure enough, someone would come running. Uh -huh. It's incredible. <laughs> Betty, <laughs> I loved him. I loved him. He was great. Oh. He, was, he was nice to me. Yeah. Treated me well. Wonderful. Except when my mother came to Washington, the Earl Theater, to bring me a chocolate cake, which I'd requested. Mm -hmm. And she walked in just at the time that Betty had just come, in, come down. He says, oh. So you're Jerry's mother? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Took the cake. <laughs> Just like that. But you know. That's the, low. But I guess he gave us enough good music that, you know. He, he gave me plenty. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I, I didn't know. I was so unsophisticated when I joined this band as to, his, as to Benny. We were on a one-nighter one time. Not a one-nighter, a theater engagement. I found myself in some joint somewhere with a great group playing. And I called him on the phone, walk him. He said, you got to come down. Uh -huh. Some great players here. You'll love it. Guy said, don't ever do that. That's, a, that's two weeks' notice. Benny came down. Wow. Came down. I must have liked I didn't him. know. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to say, you know, uh, I, I think uh, we got along well. Yeah. Did Lester Young have any peculiarities that, that you noticed at the time? Well, it was a cute thing when, when, uh, when the Basie band came up to New York. This is the, the, the finished band. This is not like the band that was in Kansas City. This is a, a full band. They had full brass, full saxes. And uh, Lester and Herschel Evans were playing in this band. And uh, uh, Lester had a cute thing that he had a, a string tied between his stand and the next sax, the third alto stand. And the middle of it was a little bell, like a tinker bell. Yes. If anybody in the band goofed, He'd ring it. <laughs> and it was the funniest thing. Someone would be playing it, and Benny, with his ear, he'd say, he'd hear something. No the, kidding. The crowd didn't get it, but, the, but the, everybody that knew would get hysterical, you know. He was That's so, great. So cute. And he would be holding his horn at that. Oh, yeah, strange... side. Sometimes wearing a hat. Most of the time wearing a hat, yeah. you know, the pork pie. So. <laughs> they made quite a splash at the, uh, was it the, uh, not the door, something door. Famous door. Famous door. That was where that, that was, was the, where that happened. That specifically. Yeah. I had taken Diana Shore for there for uh, for dinner and, and as a date. We had a date there. We were mm -hmm. both single, 
at the time, and uh, <laughs> she thought the food was the best thing. In <laughs> Dinah. <laughs> Dinah was a little, Dinah, a little, okay. little heavy at the time, you know, but she was coming along. Uh -huh. He had one other story about <clears throat> Benny Goodman I wanted yeah, to ask and it, you about. Yeah, and it's, uh, it, it relates to, uh, to Basie, uh, too. Ba Goodman and Basie, as a matter of fact. Uh, we were pl uh, I was playing the um, Hartford Theater with Benny in Connecticut, Hartford Theater in Hartford, Connecticut. And Benny said, let's, let's go hear Basie. He's at the Crystal, uh, Crystal Cave or Crystal Ballroom. I guess it was Crystal Ballroom in Hartford, which was a a uh, black nightclub mm -hmm. of some kind. And Herschel was a very good friend of mine, with ben Herschel Evans, the tenor saxophone yes. player with Benny, with the... Uh, with Basie, yeah. With Basie. And uh, they all knew I had to come out of med school. At the various times, I would do things for guys that helped them along, uh, you know, medically, either suggesting or, or even helping them, you know. But uh, we went over to hear Herschel, uh, here at Basie, and I, I, but Herschel came over to me and he said, he said, Jerry, he says, I'm having trouble breathing. I says, really? How long has that been going on? He says, well, just, you know, it's just been bad last week. He says, look, he said, his pants were unbuttoned. You know, he had suspenders, but he couldn't even button the, the top buttons. And, he's, and he, uh, he said he had changed his mouthpiece from the auto link, I guess, about a seven opening to about a four. I said, hmm. wow, that, that sounded pretty serious to me. <clears throat> I said, have you seen any, any doctors lately? He says, well, I saw some guy up in Harlem, but he said uh, he thought I had asthma. I said, asthma? So, when, so during the break, they had the, during the re, uh, rehearsal break, during the playing break, I took him back in the, in the dressing room and I stretched him out in a, on a bench, and I put my ear down, you know, to his, to his, because uh, he was so swollen. His shoelaces were untied. Oh my gosh! He was, he had something going on here, and I listened to his his belly as I, I rubbed, rolled him over like that, and I could hear a splashing. I couldn't believe what I was listening to because, uh, uh, to me, it was a thing called peritoneal ascites. It's fluid, body fluid that was that had backed up from a heart that was not pumping well enough to to do that. And that's so why I said, you know, and I'm not I'm limited, you know, I'm not I'm not a doctor, you know, this is just purely clinical stuff. So I said to uh, Basie, I said, Basie, uh, where are you going after this? We're going back to New York. I says, get him to a hospital right away. This man is seriously ill. I didn't know what, but I knew this had to do something with failure of a heart, failure of a kidney, failure of something. You know, he's all swollen, and he's loaded with edema. So, uh, Basie says, yeah, they would do that. They were going right back to the city, and which is not too far. So, uh, we got, we went back in the taxi cab, Benny, myself, and, and Harry, and whoever was there, the, whoever, the band, the manager, and I turned around, sort of musing, and I said to Benny, "You know, I think Herschel is in, is in cardiac failure. I think he's dying." He says, "What are you talking about, man? You're such a quack, you know. You know, you know, bah, 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 you know like that." Then. And uh, we were at the next recording session, which either the next day or the day after, uh, Benny got a call from John Hammond and said Herschel Evans had died. Oh. You know, and and Metronome printed that particular thing I told you about it was in the it was in a Metronome magazine, but uh, it just tore me to tore me apart because you know it's one of those funny kind of things. You don't want to wish anybody a even a bad thought, you know. Right. But I I had uh, I had dinner. I met his family in California. His, his uh, I think his brother-in-law worked for the police for the um, postal department, mm. and we you know got and talked about about Herschel, what a sweet guy, and I. I have his mouthpiece. The family gave me his mouthpiece. No kidding. Yeah. But um, I just thought it was a... Well, that is you know, quite an inside yeah. story, yeah. But don't ask me for a diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling okay today, thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's been fascinating. 
Well, thank you, really Mark. Had, I, I enjoy talking about these times. They, they, they just keep coming back. Yeah. But I have trouble remembering <laughs> names. You, know, you, you remembered mine. Yeah, I, I have to make a point that I look at your card, I looked at it again, looked at it again, and I, and I make, okay. a, make a mental picture. Right. Like uh, you said, be up here at 10.30, the room is 10.31. I said, hey, it follows the time. You know, you right. <laughs> need a little hook. <laughs> Just like music, it. we need a hook. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Well, on behalf of uh, Hamilton College, I'd like mm -hmm. to thank you very much. And hope the rest of the weekend here is, is good for you. Thank you, and I'll tell you, uh, if any of my grandchildren try to get into Hamilton College, will you help me? I, I'll put in <laughs> a good word. You turned on one of my sons already. <laughs> I'm glad we got that on tape. Is it too late for him to come back? <laughs> we'll keep it in mind. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay.